consent that immediately following that vote, the Senate proceed to consideration of S-1549, the President's jobs package. The bill be read a third time, and the Senate proceed to vote on the passage of the bill with no intervening action or debate, provided further that if the bill does not receive 60 votes on passage, the bill then be placed back on the calendar. Mr. President, Is there objection? Yes, reserving right. The majority yeah, leader. President. Everyone should understand on Thursday, on this side, we agreed to a vote on the President's jobs. Bill. Um, there have been a number of things that have occurred since then. We seek today, with this motion, to proceed to get a jobs bill, a good jobs bill. We seek to begin a legislative process. That's what this is all about. Senators from my side of the aisle and senators from the other side of the aisle, the Republican side of the aisle, have said they want to be able to get a bill where they can offer ideas to create jobs. I think that's commendable. That's what we seek to do to get on this bill. Thus, I ask my colleague, the Republican leader, that he might modify his consent request to allow the Senate to proceed to the bill so we might begin consideration, debate, and amendment to the bill. I would also say before my friend responds to my request for modification that I have said to my friends on the Republican side of the aisle and on the Democratic side of the aisle, as I said last Thursday, the President's original package that we have um, talked about here for some time People want to vote on that, they can have a vote on that. I think it would be to everyone's best interest to just move to proceed to this so we can make this legislation even better than it now is. But I ask for that modification. Does the Republican leader so modify his request? Uh, reserving the right to object. <clears throat> I've been trying here for over a week to get a vote on the President's so-called jobs proposal which he's been asking us to give him repeatedly. And our friends on the other side are not only objecting to voting on the President's original jobs proposal, but his jobs proposal as modified. The practical result, however, of voting for cloture on the motion to proceed, rather than going on and voting on the bill, as the President's repeatedly asked us to do on 12 different occasions out on the campaign trail, is that we will not be able to proceed to one of the things that are rare around here. We actually have a bipartisan agreement to go forward on these important trade agreements, to pass them tomorrow night, to have the President of South Korea uh, address a joint session of Congress, one of our most important allies, probably our most important ally in, in Asia. Why would we not want to just vote on the proposal tonight? So I'm sorry we'll not be able to do that. I'm going to continue to look for opportunities to give the President a vote he asked for, repeatedly. Not a procedural vote, but a real vote on the matter that he requested. As I said, I object. Mr. President, I will continue to work with my friend to get on a jobs bill so that the Senate can work its will and provide to the American people jobs. So I object to my friend's request. Objection is heard. Which one? The clerk will report the motion to invoke cloture. Cloture motion. We, the undersigned senators, in accordance with the provisions of Rule 22 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, hereby move to bring to a close the debate on the motion to proceed to calendar number 187, as 1660, the American Jobs Act of 2011, signed by 17 senators. By unanimous consent, the mandatory quorum call has been waived. The question is, is it the sense of the Senate the debate on the motion to proceed to S-1660, a bill to provide tax relief for American workers and businesses to put workers back on the job while rebuilding and modernizing America and to provide pathways back to work for Americans looking for jobs shall be brought to a close. The yeas and nays are mandatory under the rule. The clerk will call the roll. Yes, the uni body. Mr. Akaka. Mr. Alexander. Ms. Ayotte. Mr. Barrasso, no. Mr. Baucus, Mr. Beckage, Mr. Bennett.
Mr. Bingaman, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Bozeman, Mrs. Boxer. Mr. Brown of Massachusetts, Mr. Brown of Ohio, Mr. Burr. Ms. Cantwell. Mr. Carden, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Chambliss. Mr. Coates, Mr. Coburn, Mr. Cochran, Ms. Collins. Mr. Conrad. Mr. Coons. Mr. Corker. Mr. Cornyn. Mr. Crapo. Mr. Dement. Mr. Durbin. Mr. Enzi. Mrs. Feinstein. Mr. Franken. Mrs. Gillibrand. Mr. Graham. Grassley, Mrs. Hagen, Mr. Harkin, Mr. Hatch, Mr. Heller, Mr. Hoven.
Mrs. Hutcherson, Mr. Inhofe, Mr. No Way, Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johans, Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin, Mr. Johnson of South Dakota, Mr. Carey. Mr. Kirk, Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Cole, Mr. Kyle, Ms. Landrew, Mr. Lautenberg, Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee, Mr. Levin, Mr. Lieberman, Mr. Luger, Mr. Manchin, Mr. McCain, Mrs. McCaskill, Mr. McConnell, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Ms. Mikulski. Mr. Moran. Ms. Murkowski, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Nelson, Nebraska, Mr. Nelson of Florida. Thank you. Let me, uh, let me, uh, did I go here? Mr. Paul, Mr. Portman. Mr. Pryor, Mr. Reed of Rhode Island, Mr. Reed of Nevada, Mr. Risch, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Rockefeller, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Sessions, Mrs. Shaheen, Mr. Shelby, Ms. Snow, Ms. Sabinow, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Toomey, Mr. Udall of Colorado, Mr. Udall of New Mexico, Mr. Vitter, Mr. Warner, Mr. Webb, Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden. voting in the affirmative. Beckage, Bennett, Bingaman, Blumenthal, Boxer, Brown of Ohio, Cantwell, Cardin, Conrad, Coons, Durbin, Feinstein, Franken, Gillibrand, Hagen, Harkin, Anoue, Johnson of South Dakota, Carey, Klobuchar, Cole, Landrieu, Lautenberg, Levin, Lieberman, Manchin, McCaskill, Menendez, Mikulski, Murray, Reed of Rhode Island, Reed of Nevada, Rockefeller, Sanders, Schumer, Udall of Colorado, Udall of New Mexico, Webb, and Wyden. Mr. Baucus, aye. Mr. Akaka, aye.
Senators voting in the negative. Alexander, Ayotte, Barrasso, Blunt, Bozeman, Brown of Massachusetts, Burr, Chambliss, Coates, Cochran, Collins, Corker, Cornyn, Crapo, Dement, Enzi, Graham, Grassley, Hatch, Heller, Hogan, Hutchison, Inhofe, Isaacson, Johans, Johnson of Wisconsin, Kirk, Lee, Luger, McCain, McConnell, Moran, Murkowski, Nelson, Nebraska, Paul, Portman, Rich, Roberts, Rubio, Sessions, Shelby, Snow, Boone, Toomey, Vitter, and Wicker. Mr. Nelson of Florida. Aye. Mr. Casey, aye. Ms. Davenow, aye. Mr. White House, aye.
Mr. Warner. Mr. Warner, aye. Mr. Merkley, aye. Mr. Pryor, aye. Mr. Kyle, no. Mr. Leahy, aye.
Mr. Carper, aye.
48 senators have voted no on moving forward with the jobs package uh, here in the Senate, including two Democrats, uh, Senators Nelson and Tester. That's enough to block the bill from moving forward. Uh, Senator, Senate is voting on Senator Reid's revised version of President Obama's jobs plan that includes a 5.6 percent surtax on millionaires. Still, uh, this vote is being held open for a couple of hours for New Hampshire Senator Jean Shaheen to fly back from Boston, uh, where she's accepting an award. Uh, Politico writing about that earlier, uh, that Senator Shaheen was scheduled to attend the event where she's being given the New Englander of the Year Award. Uh, Senator Shaheen's plane is expected to land in the D.C. area at 845 Eastern, so the vote being held until she, she returns. Depending on the Senate schedule, we're planning live coverage at 10 p.m. Eastern Time here on C-SPAN 2 of the Spin Room after the Republican debate being held at Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire. Eight presidential candidates participating in the debate focusing on the economy. And the Spin Room is where candidates as well as their campaign advisors uh, speak to reporters after the debate. So we'll have that for you live if the Senate is out at 10 p.m. Eastern here on C-SPAN 2, also on C-SPAN.org. As for President Obama, uh, this debate today centering on his jobs plan, he spoke in Pittsburgh this afternoon saying that the Senate faces a, quote, moment of truth as it prepares to vote on his jobs bill. And gentlemen, the President of the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Please have a seat. Have a seat. It is great to be back in Pittsburgh. And it is wonderful to be here at IBEW Local 5. Uh, I had a chance to take a tour of your facilities uh, where you're training workers with the skills they need to compete for good jobs. And I see some of the guys that I met uh, on the tour, uh, both the instructors and uh, the, the students who are here. And it's an example of how if we get a good collaboration uh, between business and labor and, uh, you know, academia, that there's no reason why we cannot continue to have uh, the best trained workers in the world. And that's got to be one of our best <laughs> priorities. So I'm here to talk uh, about how we can create new jobs, particularly jobs doing what you do best, and that's rebuilding America. Uh, I brought some folks along with me as well. Uh, we've got members of my cabinet and my administration. Uh, we've got your mayor, uh, Luke uh, Ravenstahl, is here. Where's, where's Luke? Right here. Your county executive, Dan Honorado, is here. And, and one of my dearest friends, uh, who I stole from the Steelers to serve as the United States Ambassador to Ireland, Dan Rooney's in the house. And uh, congr congratulations, Steelers. You guys did a little better than my Bears last night. <laughs> I've also brought a group of leaders uh, with a wide range of new ideas about how we can help companies hire and grow. And we call them our White House Jobs Council. They come from some of the most uh, successful businesses in the country, GE, Southwest, Intel. Uh, they come from labor. We've got uh, Rich Trumka uh, on here from uh, the AFL-CIO. We've got uh, universities uh, and, and people uh, across the board who are intimately involved in growing companies, venture capitalists. Most importantly, they come from outside of Washington. And I told them when we formed this council, I want to hear smart, forward-thinking ideas that will help our economy and our workers adapt to changing times. And together, they've done some extraordinary work uh, to make those ideas happen. So I just want to uh, personally thank every single one of the, the job council members for the great work that they're doing. And they issued a jobs report today, 
we're implementing a bunch of their ideas. It's going to make a difference all across the country. So thank you very much. Well, one of our focuses today was on entrepreneurship. And we did this because the story of America's success is written by America's entrepreneurs. Men and women who took a chance on a dream and they turned that dream into a business and somehow changed the world. And we just lost uh, one of our greatest uh, entrepreneurs and a friend, Steve Jobs, uh, last week. And you know, to see the outpouring of support uh, for him and his legacy tells a story about what America is all about. We like to make things, create things, new products, new services. Uh, that change people's lives. And that's what people strive to do every day in this country. Now, most of the time, people's dreams are simple. Startups and storefronts on Main Street that let folks earn enough to support their family and make a contribution to their community. And sometimes their dreams take off, and those startups become companies like Apple or FedEx or Ford, companies that end up hiring and employing hundreds of thousands of Americans and giving rise to entire new industries. And that spirit of entrepreneurship and innovation is how we became the world's e uh, leading economic power. And it's what constantly rejuvenates our economy. So entrepreneurship is how we're going to create new jobs in the future. And I'm proud to say that just last month, Pittsburgh won a federal grant to promote entrepreneurship and job creation by expanding your already successful energy and healthcare industries in underserved parts of this city. And so we're very excited about what Pittsburgh's doing here. Today, my job council laid out new actions we can take together, the private sector and government, to help unleash a new era of entrepreneurship in America that will grow the economy and create jobs and strengthen our ability to compete with the rest of the world. But even as we help to fuel the next big American industry, we also understand that people are out of work right now. They need help right now. So everything that we talked about with respect to the Job Council is going to help America become more competitive, help entrepreneurs create more jobs, lay the foundation for long-term sustainable growth. But right now, our economy needs a jolt. Right now. And today, the Senate of the United States has a chance to do something about jobs right now by voting for the American Jobs Act. Now, this is a moment of truth for the U.S. Senate. In front of them is a bill, a jobs bill, that independent economists have said would grow this economy and put people back to work. This is not my opinion. It's not my administration's opinion. This is people whose job it is for a living to analyze and evaluate what kind of impact certain policies would have. They've said this could grow the economy significantly and put significant numbers of Americans back to work. And no other jobs plan has that kind of support from economists. No plan from Congress, no plan from anybody. It's a jobs bill with the kind of proposals that Democrats and Republicans have traditionally supported. It's a jobs bill that is entirely paid for by asking those of us who've been most fortunate, who've been incredibly blessed here in America, to contribute a little more to the country that contributed so much to our success. Today is the day when every American will find out exactly where their senator stands on this jobs bill. Republicans say that one of the most important things we can do is cut taxes. Then they should be for this plan. This jobs bill would cut taxes for virtually every worker and small business in America. Every single one. If you're a small business owner that hires new workers or raises, uh, raises wages, you will get another tax cut. If you hire a veteran, you get a tax cut. People who have served overseas should not have to fight for a job when they come home.
This jobs bill encourages small business owners and entrepreneurs to expand and to hire. The Senate should pass it today. Hundreds of thousands of teachers and firefighters and police officers have been laid off because of state budget cuts. I'm sure, Luke, you're seeing it here in Pittsburgh. You're having to figure out how do we make sure that we keep our teachers in the classroom. The Jobs Council is uniform in believing that the most important thing for our competitiveness long term is making sure our education system is producing outstanding young people who are, who are ready, to go to, ready to go to work. So this jobs bill... This jobs bill that the Senate is debating today would put a lot of these men and women back to work right now, and it will prevent a lot more from losing their jobs. So folks should ask their senators, why would you consider voting against putting teachers and police officers back to work? Ask them what's wrong with having folks who have made millions or billions of dollars to pay a little more, nothing punitive, just going back to the kinds of tax rates that used to exist under President Clinton so that our kids can get the education they deserve. There are more than a million laid off construction workers who could be repairing our roads and bridges and modernizing our schools right now. Right now. That's no surprise to you. Pittsburgh has a lot of bridges. Has about 300 of them. Did you know that more than a quarter of the bridges in this state are rated structurally deficient? Structurally deficient. That's a fancy way of saying they need to be fixed. There are nearly 6,000 bridges in Pennsylvania alone that local construction workers could be rebuilding right now. The average age of bridges around Pittsburgh is 54 years old. So we're still benefiting from the investments, the work that was done by our grandparents to make this a more successful, more competitive economy. Here in Pittsburgh, 54 years old, the average age of these bridges, 13 years older than the national average. The Holton Bridge over Oakmont was built more than 100 years ago. There are pieces of it that are flaking off. How much longer are we going to wait to put people back to work rebuilding bridges like that? This jobs bill will give local contractors and local construction workers the chance to get back to work rebuilding America. Why would any senator say no to that? In line with the recommendations of my jobs council, my administration's cutting red, tep, uh, cutting red tape, we're expediting several major construction projects all across the country to launch them faster and more efficiently. We want to streamline the process, the permitting process, just get, get those things moving. So we're doing our job, trying to expedite the process. Now it's time for Congress to do their job. The Senate should vote for this jobs bill today. It should not wait. It should get it done. Now a lot of folks in Congress have said they won't support any new spending that's not paid for. And I think that's important. We've got to make sure we're living within our means so that we can make the vital investments in our future. That's why I signed into law $1 trillion in spending cuts over the summer. And we'll find more places to cut those things that we don't need. We can't afford everything. We've got to make choices. We've got to prioritize. Programs that aren't working, that aren't giving us a good bang for the buck, that aren't helping to grow the economy, that aren't putting people back to work, we're going to have to trim those back. So we're willing to make tough choices. And the American people, they're already tightening their belts. They understand what it's all about to make tough choices. But if we want to create jobs and close the deficit, then we can't just cut our way out of the problem. We're also going to have to ask the wealthiest Americans to pay their fair share. If they don't, we only have three other choices. We can either increase the deficit, or we can ask the middle class to pay more at a time when they're just barely getting by, haven't seen their wages or incomes go up at all, in fact, have gone down over the last decade, or we can just sit back and do nothing. 
And I'm not willing to accept any of those three options. You know, in a... Whenever I talk about revenue, you know, people start complaining about, well, is he engaging in class warfare? Why is he going after uh, the wealthiest? Uh, look, uh, you know, because I've been fortunate and people bought a bunch of my books, I'm, I'm in that category now. And in a perfect world with unlimited resources, nobody would have to pay any taxes. But that's not the world we live in. We live in a world where we've got to make choices. So the question we have to ask ourselves as a society, as a country, is would you rather keep taxes exactly as they are for those of us who benefited most from this country, tax breaks that we don't need and weren't even asking for, or do we want construction workers and electrical workers to have jobs rebuilding our roads and our bridges and our schools? Would we rather maintain these tax breaks for the wealthiest few, or should we give tax cuts to the entrepreneurs who might need it to start that business, launch that new idea that they've got? Or tax breaks to middle class families who are likely to spend this money now and get the economy moving again? This is a matter of priorities, and it's a matter of shared sacrifice. And by the way, if you ask most wealthy Americans, they'll tell you they're willing to do more. They're willing to do their fair share to help this country that they love. So it's time to build an economy that creates good middle-class jobs in this country. It's time to build an economy that honors the values of hard work and responsibility. It's time to build an economy that lasts. And that's what this jobs bill will help us do. The proposals in the American Jobs Act aren't just a bunch of random investments to create make-work jobs. They're things we have to do if we want to compete with other countries for the best jobs and the newest industries. We have to have the most educated workers. This week I'm going to be hosting the president of South Korea. I had lunch with him in, in Seoul, South Korea. He told me, I said, what's your biggest problem? He says, the parents are too demanding. I'm having to import teachers because all our kids want to learn English when they're in first grade. So they're hiring teachers in droves at a time when we're laying them off. That doesn't make any sense. We've got to have the best transportation and communications networks in the world. We used to have the best stuff. We used to be the envy of the world. People would come to our countries and they would say, look at, look at the Hoover Dam, look at the Golden Gate Bridge. Now, People go to Beijing airport and they say, I wish we had an airport like that. We can't compete that way. Playing for second or third or fourth or eighth or fifteenth place. We've got to support new research and new technology, innovative entrepreneurs, the next generation of manufacturing. Any one of the business leaders here today will tell you that's true. If we want to compete and win in this global economy, if we want this century to be another American century, we can't just go back to an economic model that's based on how much we can borrow, how much debt we can rack up, and how much we can consume. Our prosperity has to be built on what we make and what we sell around the world and on the skills of our workers and the ingenuity of our business people. We have to restore the values that have always made this a great country. Idea of hard work and responsibility that's rewarded. Everybody from Main Street to Wall Street doing their fair share, playing by the same set of rules. And so Pittsburgh, that starts now, and I'm going to need your help. Your, se your senators are voting today on this jobs bill. So, so this, this is gut check time. Any senator who votes no should have to look you in the eye and tell you what exactly they're opposed to. These are proposals that have traditionally been bipartisan. Republicans used to want to build roads and bridges. That wasn't just a democratic idea. We've all believed that education was important. You've got to come 
If you're voting no against this bill, look at a Pittsburgh teacher in the eye and tell them just why they don't deserve to get a paycheck again and, more importantly, be able to transmit all, those, all that knowledge to their kids. Come tell the students why they don't deserve their teacher back and so that now they've got under overcrowded classrooms or you know, arts classes or music classes or science classes have been cut back. Come, come and uh, look at a, a construction worker here in Pittsburgh or an electrical worker in the eye. Tell them why they shouldn't be out there fixing uh, our bridges or rebuilding our schools and equipping them with the latest uh, science labs or the latest internet connection. Explain why people should have to keep driving their, their kids across bridges with peach, uh, pieces falling off. Or explain to a small business owner or workers in this community why you'd rather defend tax breaks for the wealthiest few than fight for tax, collect, uh, tax cuts for the middle class. I think they'd have a hard time explaining why they voted no on this bill other than the fact that I proposed it. And so I, I realize some Republicans in Washington have said that even if they agreed with the ideas in the American Jobs Act, uh, they're wary of passing it because it would give me a win. Give me a win. This is not about giving me a win. It's why folks are fed up with Washington. This is not about giving anybody a win. It's not about giving Democrats or Republicans a win. It's about giving the American people who are hurting out there a win. It's about giving small businesses, entrepreneurs, and construction workers a win. It's about giving the American people, all of us, together, a win. You know, I, was, I was talking to, to the Jobs Council. By the way, not everybody here has uh, necessarily voted for me. Um, but they're patriots, and they care about their country. And we were talking about how, you know, in normal times, these are all common sense ideas. These aren't radical ideas. These are things that traditionally everybody would be for, particularly at a time of emergency like we're in, where so many people are out of work and, and businesses want to see more customers. So for, for folks outside of Washington, being against something for the sake of politics makes absolutely no sense. It makes absolutely no sense. And the next election is 13 months away. The American people don't have the luxury of waiting 13 months. They don't have the luxury of, of, of watching uh, Washington go back and forth in the usual fashion when this economy needs to be strengthened dramatically. A lot of folks are living week to week, paycheck to paycheck, even day to day. They need action, and they need action now. They want Congress to do what they were elected to do. Put country ahead of party. Do what's right for our economy. Do what's right for our people. In other words, they want Congress to do your job. So, I've, and I've, I've said this to, to some folks in the other party. I've said, I promise you, we'll still have a lot of stuff to argue about, even if we get this thing done, about the general direction of the country and how we're going to build it and how we're going to out-educate and out-innovate and out-build uh, other countries around the world. There will be a lot of time for political debate. But right now, we need to act on behalf of the American people. So uh, for those of you who are in the audience or those of you who are watching, I need you to call, email, tweet, fax, or you can write an old-fashioned letter. I don't know if people still do that. Let Congress know who they work for. Remind them what's at stake when they cast their vote. Tell them that the time for gridlock and games is over, the time for action is now, and tell them to pass this bill. If you want construction workers on the job, pass the bill. If you want teachers back in the classroom, 
pass the bill. If you want tax cuts for your family and small business owners, pass this bill. If you want our veterans to share in the opportunity that they upheld and they defended, do the right thing. Pass this bill. All right, now's the time to act. You know, I know that uh, there's a moment where a lot of folks are wondering uh, whether America uh, can move forward together uh, the way it used to. And, I, and I'm confident we can. You know, we're not a people who just sit by and watch things happen to us. We shape our own destiny. That's what's always set us apart. We are Americans, and we are tougher than the times we're in right now. We've been through tougher times before. We're bigger than the politics that has been constraining us. You know, we can write our own story. We can do it again. So let's meet this moment. Let's get to work and show the rest of the world just why it is that America is the greatest country on earth. Thank you very much, everybody. God bless you. God bless America. So the vote to move forward on Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid's version of the President's Jobs Bill has failed. 48 senators have voted no on moving forward with the jobs package, including two Democrats, a Senators Nelson and Tester. But the vote is being held open until a Democratic Senator Jean Shaheen casts her vote. A senator is being given an award in Boston this evening. Her flight is expected to land back in the D.C. area at 845 Eastern. A headline in Congressional Quarterly, Cantor calls for advancing pieces of Obama's jobs plan. House Majority Leader Eric Cantor said it was time for Democrats and Republicans to find areas of commonality. He said that the Senate's expected rejection of a motion to invoke cloture on the package of tax cuts and new spending will mark the end of political games. Uh, Mr. Cantor declined to specify which proposals in the president's plan House Republicans would support. Instead, he cited a September 16th memo in which Republican leaders described more than a dozen areas of potential common agreement and legislative proposals that he say are worth further discussion. Also, I wanted to remind you that if the Senate is out, uh, we'll have live coverage of the spin room uh, following the Republican debate in New Hampshire tonight. Uh, the spin room is where the candidates and their campaign advisors speak to reporters after the debate. Uh, we'll have that live if the Senate is out at 10 p.m. Eastern here on C-SPAN 2 and also at cspan.org. The Senate Finance Committee met earlier today and approved free trade agreements with South Korea, Panama, and Colombia. And the House a few minutes ago began debate on those agreements, so both the full House and the Senate are expected to vote tomorrow on those trade deals. Uh, supporters expect the deals to boost U.S. exports by $13 billion a year. Here's the Senate markup from today. We'll watch this until Senator Shaheen casts her vote. Come to order to um, consider bills to implement three trade agreements the United States Columbia Trade Promotion Agreement, the United States Panama Trade Promotion Agreement, and the United States Korea Free Trade Agreement. The committee will also consider four trade nominees Michael Punk to be Deputy U.S. Trade Representative and U.S. Ambassador to the World Trade Organization, Islam 
Siddiqui to be Chief Agriculture Negotiator at the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative, and Paul Bacuato to be Assistant Secretary of Commerce, and David Johansson to be a member of the United States International Trade Commission. John Quincy Adams once said, Patience and perseverance have a magical effect, before which difficulties disappear and obstacles vanish. Our free trade agreements with Colombia, Panama, and South Korea are nearing the end of a long journey. We have faced difficulties and obstacles along the way. But thanks to the patience and perseverance of many, we overcame them. We are now poised to give these agreements our final approval. The Columbia, Panama, and South Korean trade agreements will create tens of thousands of American jobs. They'll give our They will give our ranchers, farmers, workers, and businesses a competitive edge in three lucrative, fast-growing markets. They will increase U.S. exports by $13 billion. They will boost our GDP by more than $15 billion. They are what our economy needs right now. The journey of these agreements began during the Bush administration. They negotiated robust commitments to open markets for American manufactured goods, farm products, and services. In 2007, Congress continued the journey when we negotiated the May 10 bipartisan trade deal. That deal amended these trade agreements to include the strongest labor and environmental provisions of any trade agreement in the world. But after the agreements were signed, obstacles remained. American ranchers, workers, and businesses still could not compete on a level playing field. American beef and autos faced entrenched barriers. Labor conditions in Colombia had improved, but problems persisted. And serious concerns remained about tax evasion and money laundering in Panama. President Obama and his administration worked with Congress to tackle these problems. We improved access for U.S. beef by creating a fund to promote beef sales in Korea and committing to remove unscientific barriers. We eliminated more non-tariff barriers on U.S. autos in Korea. And we negotiated a labor action plan with Colombia to protect workers and worker rights. And we signed an agreement with Panama to improve tax transparency. With these concerns addressed, only one hurdle remained, renewing trade adjustment assistance. When workers lose their jobs because of foreign competition, trade adjustment assistance gives them the job training, income support, and health benefits they need to find new employment. Since 2009 alone, nearly 450,000 American workers have been eligible for TAA. And despite the Great Recession, more than half of these workers have found new jobs. Keep them their jobs. I'm going to have to ask um, to, for those in the audience to refrain, please, to um, don't disrupt, um, because if the disruption continues, we're going to have to uh, take other action. But I just ask you, uh, please, not disrupt uh, during the proceedings. Trade adjustment assistance has been a pillar of American trade policy for five decades. It has broad support, but the program expired in February. Congress has never voted to approve one trade agreement, much less three, without the worker protections of trade adjustment assistance in place. Without trade adjustment assistance, Congress could not pass trade agreements. But perseverance paid off. In June, I negotiated an agreement with my good friend Dave Camp, Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. Our agreement renewed all of the core provisions of trade adjustment assistance. Two weeks ago, the Senate approved our agreement with 69 votes. That vote removed the last obstacle and allowed the President to submit the trade agreements to Congress. No one has worked harder to get these trade agreements approved than American farmers. Take Gordon Stoner, a wheat farmer from Outlook, Montana, in May, Gordon left his wheat farm in the middle of spring planting to testify before this committee about the Columbia Free Trade Agreement. He told us that American farmers are losing the Colombian market to their competitors from Argentina, Brazil, and Canada. He explained that these countries have signed their own deals with Colombia. They give their farmers a competitive advantage over ours. But Gordon, like all American farmers, is nothing if not patient and perseverant. He told us that if we approve the Columbia FTA, our farmers will recapture this vital market. 
The International Trade Commission agrees. They estimate that the Colombia Agreement will increase the value of U.S. grain sales to Colombia by up to 80 percent. Finally, we cannot forget the patience and perseverance of our FTA partners. Earlier this year, I visited Colombia, met with President Santos, members of his cabinet, labor leaders, and businessmen and women. I saw a country healing from the wounds of war and expanding its economy. I saw a country returning land to poor farmers and compensating victims of violence. And I saw a country stemming the flow of illegal narcotics, narcotics and the violence that accompanied it. In just 10 years, Colombia has moved from the brink of being a failed state to becoming a leading nation in the hemisphere. And despite this process... Killing labor leaders. Can we come to order? Comments from the audience are inappropriate. There's a time and place for everything. There's a time for demonstrations. There's a time for statements. And there's a time... And any further disruption will cause the community to recess until the police can restore order. Despite the progress we've made with Columbia, the outlook for approval of the Columbia FTA was very much in doubt at the time of my visit in February. Colombians were deeply and rightly concerned. But I gave them my word that the three FTAs, including the Columbia FTA, would move forward together or not at all, including passage of trade adjustment assistance. Today, their patience and perseverance have paid off. The Committee is also considering the nominations for trade officials today. Each of the nominees has shown uncommon patience and perseverance in reaching at this point. Michael Punk, a distinguished Montanan, has been nominated to be Deputy U.S. Trade Representative and Ambassador of the World Trade Organization. Islam Siddiqui has been nominated to be the Chief Agriculture Negotiator in the Office of U.S. Trade Representative. And Paul Pequato has been nominated to be Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Import Administration. And David Johansson, nominated to be a member of the International Trade Commission. Each of these nominees has the energy, the skill, and the creativity, and the commitment to fulfill the important roles they've been asked to perform. I strongly support each nominee and hope the Senate will act quickly to confirm them. So today, as we take a major step forward to advance America's trade agenda, let us remember the wisdom of John Quincy Adams. Let us show once again the difficulties that disappear and the obstacles vanish in the face of patience and perseverance. Let us approve the free trade agreements with Colombia, Panama, and South Korea, no. and boost U.S. exports and great jobs here at home. And let us favorably report these four nominees to help carry out our trade agenda. Sir Hatch. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I agree with the four nominees. And uh, approximately nine years ago, Congress provided President Bush with trade promotion authority. President Bush aggressively used that authority to negotiate 11 trade agreements with 16 countries, including the three agreements we are considering here today. The first two agreements, Chile and Singapore, have been in effect for over six years. Since that time, the export of U.S. goods to those two countries grew from $410 million to $15.3 billion. Now, prior to 2007, nine more FTAs were negotiated providing unprecedented access to growing markets for U.S. exports. Yet since December 2007, not a single new trade agreement has been negotiated or approved. And the three pending agreements, ready for a vote, languished, uh, and frankly, uh, as, as uh, a Democratic Congress and the new president placed new demands on our trading partners and new preconditions for their consideration. For almost four years, we have stood still and done nothing and while other countries raced ahead and seized America's market share around the world. In a time of economic uncertainty and weak job growth, this failure to act by the administration remains shocking. From 2005 to 2010, the U.S. trade surplus with its recent free trade uh, partners surged from $1.7 billion to $24.5 billion, excluding oil. In contrast, our trade deficit with the rest of the world remains stubbornly high over those years. But despite the many obstacles thrown in the way, we and our trading partners persevered. And now very soon we will finally complete the work that was begun so long ago. 
The gains that will result for American workers, exporters, and consumers are long overdue. There are far too many people to thank for getting us here today, so let me just note my appreciation for the efforts of Chairman Baucus and his staff in working with us to expedite consideration of these FTAs in the Finance Committee and on the Senate floor. It's no surprise that the American people do not hold Congress in the highest regard, yet I think it is worth recalling that while the President waited almost three years before he finally submitted these FTAs only eight days ago, Congress will act in a matter of days to quickly consider them and hopefully get them across the finish line. I would, I would also like to thank all the USTR negotiators who worked tirelessly and traveled around the world to negotiate these agreements. Approval of these three free trade agreements will enable U.S. exporters to finally take advantage of the benefits from these agreements that our negotiators secured over four years ago. These countries maintain high tariff barriers to our exports, while most of their exports enter our market with little or no duty. Approval of these three trade agreements will finally provide fair access for U.S. exporters. They will also alleviate the unfair advantage that many of our trading partners, such as Canada and the European Union, have gained in, the, in these uh, growing markets while we stood still and failed to act. Finally, approval... I'd like to advise the public that disruptions in the form of signs or outbursts will not be tolerated. And if they continue, I'm going to have to ask the, the committee to stand in recess uh, until, the recess can, until the order can be restored. Um, here in this hearing. Well, let me I, that's, I, if I must, yeah, Senator McGill, yeah. um, I think it's preferable that those who have different points of views stay, but I think it's preferable that those who stay uh, do not indulge in outbursts um, during this proceeding. But if those who stay do indulge in outbursts, I have no choice but to um, call the committee to order and have the committee stand recess until the police can restore order. Senator Hatch. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Finally, approval of these agreements will cement our friendship and alliance with three key partners, each of whom deserves our continued support. <coughs> Let's start with Colombia. A decade ago, Colombia, Colombia was close to becoming a poster child of a failed narcotics. We're going to order. The committee will be order. The committee will stand in recess until the police can restore order. Trade agreements kill jobs. Great trade agreements kill U.S. jobs. Colombia is killing. Colombia is killing trade Stop unions talking. all the time. Stop Shame! 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 Colombia is killing trade union leaders. We want jobs here. Free trade kills jobs. Should I finish? Uh, Just Sir about Hatch. done. Sir Hatch. Let's start with Colombia. A decade ago, Colombia was close to becoming a poster child for the failed narco state. Thanks largely to the brave leadership of key Colombian government officials, the story is very different today. Colombia's economy is growing, employment is up, and violence is markedly decreased. Institutional reforms are creating a stronger and more vibrant democracy. Land reform and reparations for victims of violence continue to advance in an unprecedented effort to heal the wounds of the past. Along the way, the United States provided important support for Colombia. Approval of our FTA with Colombia will reaffirm our support for Colombia in its long battle for democracy and long-standing commitment to the rule of law, as well as provide important new market access for U.S. exports. Panama is a thriving democracy. With one of the fastest-growing economies in Latin America, Panama is a land of new opportunities for workers and entrepreneurs from around the world. Panama's commitment to open markets and adoption of fiscal transparency secures its place as one of the financial hubs of the world. With the approval of our free trade agreement with Panama, the United States has the opportunity to provide significant new access for U.S. businesses and workers to this growing economy. South Korea is one of our strongest allies in North Asia and is currently our fourth largest export market in the world. Approval of this high standard trade agreement will serve as a model for trade agreements in the region and reaffirm our commitment to strategic engagement in the Asian Pacific region. Each of these agreements provides important benefits to the United States, but at the end of the day, much more is at stake. Over the past five years, the position of the United States as a global leader in trade liberalization has weakened. 
Our inaction on these highly beneficial trade agreements for so many years has led many to doubt whether the United States remains serious about addressing the world's and its own economic challenges, and whether we can be counted upon to deliver on our promises. With the approval of these three free trade agreements, we can begin taking the first steps toward rebuilding our image as a global leader on trade, while at the same time providing much-needed economic opportunities to U.S. workers and job creators here at home. I'm also pleased that we will be considering our trade nominations today. I greatly admire the willingness of each of these individuals to serve and hope that they will be quickly confirmed by the U.S. Senate. So, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your leadership on these matters. Appreciate it very much, and, uh, and uh, I'm prepared to go ahead. Well, thank you very much, Senator. Now, we should recognize other senators that wish to speak. Uh, I ask to hold remarks to about four minutes. In order of arrival, um, I have Senator White. Then I'll, I'll, go, then I'll go back and forth. Democrats, Republicans. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman and colleagues, I'll, I'll be brief. As chairman of our trade subcommittee here at the Finance Committee, it's become evident that there is ongoing significant demand for American goods and services around the world. And we have a chance to feed that demand and feed it through American exports. And what that means is, for our constituents, we can grow things here, we can make things here, we can add value to them here, and then we can ship them all over the world. And that translates into family wage jobs for our constituents. And I want to just make one point that I think is indisputable with respect to this trade debate, because certainly there are a lot of differences of opinion with respect to trade. But there is one fact that is indisputable indisputable, and that is that our markets are overwhelmingly open to countries around the world, and again and again we find that our trading partners have significant barriers, are remarkably closed to us, and that applies to agriculture, it applies to wood products, it applies to steel. And in the debate over the next few uh, days, I'm going to be going through some of the differentials in the barriers, but just wanted to cite one. Oregon exports of beef face a 40% tariff upon arrival into Korea, but Korean beef often only faces a tariff of 4% when it arrives in the United States. So if you can go forward with a trade policy that touches on this issue of leveling the playing field, our exporters, our companies, and our workers can get more out of this than those around the world. So I look forward to working with our colleagues on a bipartisan basis, and I yield, uh, I yield the rest of my time. Can we have an order? Uh, can we stand a recess? Until re order can be restored. May it be in order. Um, actually, I'm going to overrule myself here because I know the Senator Stabenow came very early. And um, so next is on the list here is Senator Stabenow. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, I'm going to say with the three trade agreements that we have, uh, I will be supporting Korea but opposing Colombia and Panama. And I'd like to just briefly say why. Uh, on Korea, when the agreement was first signed in 2007, I strongly opposed it because it didn't do enough in terms of American manufacturing, particularly automobiles but other manufacturers as well. Uh, I appreciate the work of the Obama administration in renegotiating the auto provisions to ensure that American automobiles will be in fact allowed open access into South Korea. I appreciate the fact that he listened to the concerns of workers and uh, the companies regarding that. With my chair of the Agricultural Committee hat on, I would just simply say South Korea is our fifth biggest market for agricult agricultural exports, as you know. Nearly two-thirds of our exports will enter Korea duty-free once the agreement is signed into force. So I'm supportive of that. Uh, I do want to register, though, my opposition on Korea. 
Uh, they do, in fact, continue to oppress their workers. The administration tried to address this through their labor action plan, but unfortunately it was not included in the agreement. And I believe that without it, we have no way of ensuring that Colombia will follow through on its commitments. It's still a very extremely da uh, dangerous place to work. Last year, 51 labor leaders were assassinated. So far this year, 23 leaders have been assassinated. And I believe it's not just a human rights issue, which of course is very important, but it's an issue that affects American workers because they are undercut when the wages of Colombian workers are kept artificially low due to the denial of basic worker rights. And then finally, Finally, in Panama, Panama has a history of allowing businesses to establish subsidiaries in Panama, as we know, to evade U.S. taxes. Panama has not yet shown, in my judgment, that they will no longer be a tax haven. Uh, Panama agreement would require the United States to waive Buy America requirements for procurement bids from thousands of foreign firms, including Chinese firms incorporated in this major tax haven. And they also have a history of denying uh, basic worker rights. And Mr. Chairman, I would finally just say that as we enter into uh, what will be three new agreements, and we have more than 300 trade agreements right now, uh, we still have the smallest trade enforcement office according of any industrialized country, according to uh, former USTR Mickey Cantor, who's spoken before the committee. You and I have talked about this before, the need to have someone to focus specifically on trade enforcement. Uh, last week, as part of the uh, fight uh, against currency manipulation with China, Senator Lindsey Graham and I introduced an amendment that would create a chief trade enforcement official. I still believe very strongly that we need that. Uh, the majority of our USTR is focused on creating agreements but not enforcing them. And so uh, I think it's very important for our businesses and our workers we have a level playing field. And uh, the bottom line for me is we want to export our products and not our jobs. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you, Senator. Our next, uh, Senator Menendez. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to first uh, thank you for your tireless commitment to ensuring that the extension of trade adjustment assistance as we are talking about these trade agreements that that in fact uh, is moving forward for Americans whose jobs are displaced as a result of trade and while uh, there may the argument has been made that uh, these FTAs may create as many as 70,000 American jobs uh, the benefits of trade are not uniform uh, not everyone will benefit from these agreements and I find it uh, uh, morally wrong to look at an American and say simply because of our trade agreements you happen to be the victim of economic displacement and you're on your own. Uh, and that's what would happen if we did not have trade adjustment assistance moving forward as well. So I appreciate the chairman's efforts in making that a reality. The simultaneous consideration of TAA reflects an understanding of that complexity of trade policy and the need to take care of our own hard-working Americans who may lose their jobs due to trade. Now, Mr. Chairman, I intend to support the Korea and Panama Agreement, but I continue to have concerns and will oppose the Colombia Agreement because of ongoing labor violence in the country and because the agreement doesn't underscore the importance of that issue. Uh, I have been one of the strongest supporters of Colombia as uh, a member in the House International Relations Committee. Uh, on the Western Hemisphere Subcommittee. I have been one of the strongest supporters of Colombia as a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee chairing the Western Hemisphere Subcommittee. It has made great progress in rooting out the drug cartels that threaten the very stability of that nation and has emerged as a stronger democratic nation. It now lending its expertise to other countries who are threatened by the scourge of the narcotics trade. It has strengthened its democracy in so many ways and it's to be applauded for all of that. However, uh, I read and I ask unanimous consent that uh, today's uh, AP article uh, be included in the record. Uh, a Human Rights Watch study uh, found, quote, virtually no progress in getting convictions for killings that have occurred in the past four and a half years. It counted just six convictions obtained by a special prosecution's unit from 195 slayings, with nearly nine in ten of the unit's cases from that period in preliminary stages with no suspect formally identified. 
Uh, Colombia is the world's most lethal country for labor organizing, and the killings haven't stopped. At least 38 trade unionists have been slain since President Juan Manuel Santos took office in, January, in August of 2010, uh, according to Colombia's National Labor School. Convictions have been obtained for less than 10 percent of the 2,886 trade unionists killed since 1986 less than 10 percent. And the rights group have found severe shortcomings in the special units uh, that are supposed to be pursuing this. So I'd ask unanimous consent so I don't read the entire uh, uh, article into the Objection. record. Objection. Uh, and during the mock-up uh, hearing, uh, I had offered uh, as part of uh, an effort to be in a position where I could have supported uh, the Columbia plan. The Columbia Labor Action Plan uh, is a positive step uh, towards addressing labor violence in Colombia, and it was my hope that the text of the plan and reporting requirements would have been included in the implementing legislation, and I sought to do that during the markup. I, I sought to include language that would have required the President to report to the Congress annually on the implementation and enforcement of the Columbia Labor Action Plan by the Government of Colombia. This inclusion would have been consistent with reporting requirements in other FTAs. My reporting requirement mirrored one included exactly in the CAFTA implementing legislation and NAFTA's implementing legislation, which also provides precedent, precedent for the inclusion of reporting requirements. I'm disappointed that neither the labor plan nor reporting requirements for the plan are included in the implementing legislation to ensure that Colombia's labor leaders are not forgotten once this agreement is implemented. And that is crucial because as we have seen, if you're a labor leader in Colombia, you're likely to die. Uh, in fact, uh, it is because of that, uh, that despite my admiration for how far Colombia has come, I cannot in good conscience support the Colombia Labor Agreement and I will be voting uh, against it. And I ask my full statement be included in the record. Thank you, uh, Sir Mendez. Senator Carver. Next. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. In uh, discussing uh, these labor proposals, these are, uh, free trade agreements with um, some of our uh, labor leaders in Delaware, uh, one of the things we talked about a month or two ago and again even uh, this week was uh, how did we get into the situation where the United States basically allows other countries to sell their goods and services here without impediment? Now, they want to sell their whatever they're making, whether it's cars in Korea or other products, they sell it here. We don't have uh, many tariff barriers or non-tariff barriers, but when we try to sell our goods and services there, they erect these barriers. Why is that? And uh, what I've learned in drilling down on this is, if you go back to the end of World War II, um, we emerged from World War II with the strongest economy on earth, and we were the 800-pound gorilla in the room when it came to international trade. We made better products, we dominated markets, whether it was cars or just about anything you can think of. And other countries, in an effort to try to protect their markets and build their domestic markets, they began to erect barriers to keep our goods and services out. As time goes by, they've gotten to be a lot better, stronger competitors. And frankly, the time has come to level the playing field. And I think what the president has tried to do is to say, you know, game over. Uh, we're tired of the fact that after all these years, other countries are still trying to keep our products out, whether they happen to be cars, whether they happen to be chemicals, whether they happen to be poultry, uh, whether they happen to be financial services. We're tired of you keeping our stuff out. We allow you to sell your products here. We don't try to stop it. And it's time for you to cut it out. I think that's really the bottom line of what's uh, going on here. And someone asked me today in, in, in a conference call I had with some, some labor friends, and he said, how do we know this is going to work? And at the end of the day, what we need to do is like stay on it and to make sure it's being implemented. The president says on Columbia, if, uh, if the implementation plan is not fully implemented, you know, we're not going to implement the free trade agreement. I mean, he's been about as blunt and direct as he can be. And I would just say to, uh, to everyone who's raised a concern about whether well, there's a death of a labor leader, a teacher, or a judge in Columbia, one death of any of those people is too many. And the idea, some people will say, we should feel better because the numbers are down from 200 plus to down as low as 20 or 25. One death is too many. 
and it's important that we remain vigilant and make sure the Colombian government knows we're going to be remaining vigilant. We fully expect them to comply with that implementation plan. We're not going to go away, and they've got to know that. Thanks very much. Thank you, Senator. Senator Roberts, you're next. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, want to thank you as well as other members have expressed their uh, support on your behalf for your perseverance and uh, for your efforts in behalf of these agreements. I think collectively, at least, the information I have that the uh, three trade agreements add up to about 13 billion in additional exports. That's about 250,000 jobs. And I would also say that under the trade agreements, um, the exports from Colombia and Panama have already come in uh, duty-free for years now under a variety of preference programs. What these agreements merely do is level the playing field and address some of the concerns that my colleagues have, extend the same benefits to U.S. producers and exporters who still face the tariffs and other barriers to these markets. So I, I think the answer to it is obvious. Kansas Farm Bureau estimates that these uh, agreements will increase direct exports by $130 million for our Kansas uh, ranchers and farmers and create an additional 1,150 jobs. Delay is not without consequence, and there's been a lot of delay on these three agreements. Uh, my colleagues on the other side have addressed uh, some of the problems. But it's uh, not without consequences. Right now, some 100-plus trade agreements are being negotiated without uh, the United States. That's not including the trade agreements that have entered into force uh, already. I think um, just for the amount of time that we have, uh, I'm going to take the time to thank Senator Wyden for his summary in regards to how he says the situation worldwide with trade, thanking for his diligent efforts as the subcommittee chairman and I want to associate myself with your remarks. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Crapo, you're next. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Congress is hopefully on the cusp of passing uh, historic trade legislation, and while auspicious, this is not a moment, in my opinion, that reflects well on Congress, the administration, or our country. For almost four years, our trade competitors have enacted agreements that erode our export markets while we have, frankly, yielded the field. The rest of the world has been busy signing new agreements, expanding markets, and creating trading alliances. If ever there were a self-inflicted wound, this is it. For years, a bipartisan majority in Congress has been ready to help our exporters find new market opportunities and reduce consumer prices on the many goods that we import. That's why it's truly a shame that we have had to face this kind of delay in the United States. I have, uh, with concern, seen that just days ago the President has put yet another apparent roadblock in the way of implementing the Colombian Free Trade Agreement, saying he will forego implementation until Colombia fulfills its commitments under the Labor Action Plan. This despite repeated confirmation from U.S. Trade Representative Kirk that, the Colum that Columbia has met its obligations. Well, finally, here we are at the next to the last step, but support for these agreements has never really been in doubt. Mr. Chairman, I have a, an extended statement here going over the benefits of each of these agreements, which I would forego and request that the full, agreement, the full statement be made a part of the record. No objection. But thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just say that uh, consideration of trade agreements by the Finance Committee has, long, has a, a really long and distinguished history with bipartisan cooperation and progress on behalf of the American people. And I appreciate the Chairman's efforts to get us to this point because I know that you have been supportive of doing so. Uh, it's time now that the administration and the members of Congress remember that the tradition this committee has set up benefits our nation greatly as we move forward and keep our nation competitive in world markets. And I appreciate the fact, Mr. Chairman, that you have moved as quickly as you can once the opportunity has presented itself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator, for those comments. Senator Cardin. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I also appreciate your leadership in the manner in which these free trade agreements have been handled. Uh, trade is critically important to our country. It's critically important to my state of Maryland. The Port of Baltimore is 
very important economic engine of my state. And yes, we want to see our poor busy with imports, but also exports. So having a balanced trade agreement to us is very, very important. Uh, I will not support the Columbia Free Trade Agreement, and I want to give my reasons why. Some of the proudest moments in America's history is when we stood up for human rights and were prepared to use trade as a way of advancing international human rights. The jackson Vanek Law was an important statement by this country, but also changed the habits within the former Soviet Union. The United States led internationally on the use of, uh, of trade to change the apartheid government of South Africa. So I think trade is an important tool that we have. And in Colombia, let me just quote, if I might, from the 2010 State Department Human Rights Report. This is what they said, 2010. Unlawful and extrajudicial killings, insubordinate military collaboration with new illegal arms groups, forced disappearance, torture, and mistreatment of detainees, arbitrary detentions, impunity and inefficient judicial subject to intimidation, illegal surveillance of civilian groups, political opponents and government agencies, occasional harassment and intimidation of journalists, harassment of human rights groups and activists, including unfounded prosecutions, violence against women, including rape, societal discrimination against women, indigenous persons, and afro colombians illegal child labor, and the list goes on. I do want to point out, Mr. Chairman, that the report also notes that the Santos administration has made demonstrable advances in improving the human rights environment. And we all know that. My concern is that we did not incorporate the type of changes into this agreement that we should. That's why I offered an amendment to this free trade agreement during the committee mock markup this past July that would have codified the commitments of the Columbia Labor Action Plan within the body of the agreement to ensure that it's acted upon in part of the agreement in perpetuity. I was listening to Senator Menendez, and I agree with the comments that he has made. I was disappointed that we did not include that, and I'm disappointed that the administration did not include the continuing way to enforce the type of labor commitments that supposedly are part of this agreement. For all those reasons and others, I will not support the Columbia Free Trade Agreement. Thank you, Senator. Senator Kerry. Senator Kerry, you're next. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I'm, like everybody, I'm very pleased that you've uh, worked hard to get us to the point of bringing these three agreements forward. And uh, the Korea Agreement, well, let me just say generally about all of them, I, as we hear important voices from uh, America talking about jobs and across the country. I really think it's important for people to look at the four corners of these agreements and, and take a hard look and read them because the fact is these agreements are fairly one-sided in our favor. They actually open up markets that are close to us and equal a playing field that's been unequal against us for a long period of time. So I just urge people, rather than sort of being an automatic, to look at it. I understand the Columbia, and I'll speak to that in a minute, but these agreements actually create jobs for Americans. And the fact is that the tariff cuts alone in the U.S.-South Korea trade agreement is going to increase exports of American goods by $10 billion to $11 billion. Now, those $11 billion represent jobs for America, and we will not have those jobs if we do not have this agreement. The Panama Agreement also guarantees access to a $20.6 billion services market and a strategic location as a major shipping route. And to address our concerns with the banking laws, which we thought were not fair for us, Panama signed a tax information exchange agreement and it's mended its domestic law to deal with the problem of anonymous accounts. Those are all benefits for us. They help us with accountability in the global marketplace. But obviously, the most, uh, the most controversial agreement is the Columbia Agreement. And I really am very uh, sympathetic and I'm mindful, as chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, to the comments of two very valuable members of our committee, uh, Senator Cardin, who uh, works and heads up our, our, our Helsinki Commission and works constantly on this, and Senator Menendez, uh, there's no stronger voice than these things. But there can be differences of opinion, even as we all acknowledge that there are continued abuses, there are continued problems. I understand that. Nobody's blind to that. But a lot of us have pushed for a long time on 
Columbia's efforts to institute a strong Ministry of Labor. That's been one of our goals. And though the ministry was not in the specific Labor Action Plan, the Columbia Congress recently passed a measure requiring the executive to create one by the end of next month. Columbia has also passed laws that we pushed them to pass to stem the abuse of contract labor and enforcement. Has it accomplished everything we wanted to accomplish? No. But it's passed and it's in place and it's moving. And most people in Bogota and Columbia are watchers elsewhere use phrases like cautious optimism to describe the changes of the last year in Colombia. They say it's fragile but hopeful time. Now you can take, you know, you can look at this both ways. You can say, oh, we're just going to cut it, we're going to say this or that. I tell you, if we do that, we lose any leverage whatsoever that we may or may not think we have. Gone. No reason after all these years of debate about this for anybody to believe anything the United States says is important because they do the things and they do the things and they keep moving at great risk. This is a country in which 12 or 13 members of the Supreme Court were assassinated one day when a gunman just watched in and shot everybody. A country where presidential candidates running for office to change their country were assassinated while trying to do it. A country in which countless candidates have been assassinated and people have taken great risks. President Uribe previously and President Santos now who only took office last August. He's championed reforms such as the victims law and the land restitution law. In order to address this question of violence, he reversed the anti-activist rhetoric in Bogota and during his administration, yes, they've only been selective, Senator Cardin, I agree with you. But they have finally taken on some high-profile human rights abuses. Do they need to do more? You bet they do. Is it at an acceptable level? No, it's not. But I believe our best hope in order to get them to continue to believe in us and have a relationship with us that matters and to be able to leverage the things that are of interest is to help their society to be able to stabilize and grow. And if they don't have some efforts where their economy improves to do that, I don't think we can do that. General Hill testified before this committee and said, Colombia has come back from the brink of becoming a failed state in the 1980s and 90s. Having been involved throughout that period as I was, both on the Foreign Relations Committee and the Banking Committee in the 1980s and 90s in our efforts to address an incredibly toxic brew of flow of drugs, illicit money, guns, narcotics, contraband throughout the region, uh, a time when we found you know, major banking abuses, which included Osama bin Laden and Manuel Noriega. All of this, we've seen an incredible transition taking place and I'm voting for the future. I'm voting for the idea that Colombia is in fact qualified as fragile and cautious because these advances could easily unravel. And I think it's critical with the passage of this uh, agreement that we'll be taking steps that actually increase our leverage, increase the odds of better outcomes, and hopefully will allow us to continue to address the abuses that we know have continued. And that's a, a future that I think is worth investing in. Thank you. Thank you, thank, thank you, sen thank you Senator. Sen Senator Cantwell. Senator Cantwell, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm submitting a statement for the record. Okay, Senator Cantwell. Uh, Senator Bingaman. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> I congratulate you on your hard work on these uh, three agreements. I support them. Let me raise an issue that uh, I raised when we had the committee mock markup in July. That is the issue of our lack of resources in the U.S. Trade Representative's Office to actually enforce these agreements. I think uh, it's clear that we do not adequately uh, fund that office. I think it's clear that the General Counsel's Office within the U.S. Trade Representative's Office is, uh, has too few people to uh, enforce the various agreements we've already entered into and now with uh, the entering into of these these additional agreements we are going to be substantially uh, under uh, staffed and under resourced. Uh, I, I hope that uh, at the time that we had the mock markup I tried to suggest that we should include something there 
there to uh, recommend to the administration that they uh, re request in the, in the implementing legislation uh, additional funds. Uh, that was considered out of order. Uh, some way or other, I, I believe it's imperative that we make the point to this administration and to the appropriations committees in the House and Senate that they need to give more resources to the general counsel's office if we're going to see proper monitoring and enforcement of these trade agreements uh, because, um, frankly, I think uh, they're understaffed and overworked right now, and I think... Uh, uh, I know Senator Crapo made the point. He said that uh, he thought that the failure to bring these trade agreements forward was a self-inflicted wound. I think the failure to adequately staff and resource the U.S. Trade Representative's Office is a self-inflicted wound, which we continue to perpetuate here in this uh, Congress. I think it's uh, very short-sighted. So I'll stop with that and uh, let you get on with the rest of the s statements. Thank you very much, Senator. Uh, Senator Thune. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> There's the old saying that it's better late than never, and I think it uh, applies in this case. It's been over four years now since um, these agreements were signed, and I'm pleased that we're finally where we are. And I just have to look at the, uh, in, on August 15th, Canada signed a, an agreement, or entered into an agreement, I should say, with Colombia. Since that time, Canadian wheat exports to Colombia have increased by 18.3%. Uh, I think that's what this means for American agriculture, and I think it's uh, pretty clear that you can't stand still on trade. Um, we have either, we've got to be either moving forward or the rest of the world's going to move uh, forward without us, and that's going to be the detriment of American producers and consumers. So uh, I'm glad we're finally moving these agreements forward. I know I join with uh, most of my colleagues on the committee, at least, when I say that I look forward to the passage of these bills and, uh, and what it can mean for uh, American exporters for jobs for people in this country, and uh, and I think those are all things that uh, many of us want to see happen. And so I'm uh, I'm anxious to get these things moving and uh, look forward to uh, to voting to pass them out. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I don't see any senators uh, present who wish to make any opening statements. I would though um, like to welcome special guests we have, we have with us today, uh, Columbia's Ambassador Gabriel Silva. South Korea's Ambassador Hun Duk Su, and Panama's Ambassador Mario Hameyo. Thank you all very much for being here. Uh, we're very honored to have you present with us today. I'd now like to turn to the trade agreements themselves. On July 7th, the committee held a mock markup to draft bills to implement each agreement. On October 3rd, the President submitted the final implementing bills to the Congress. The final bills are substantially similar to the draft bills. Under the fast track rules, the committee may not amend the bills. We will vote only on whether to report them. I will start with S1641, the bill to implement the Columbia Agreement. We have an administration official here to answer any questions. Uh, Tim Reeve, General Counsel for the Office of USTR, is here. Thank you. Mr. Reeve, for your Aye. presence. Also, Mr. Mike Smart uh, from my staff to walk through the bill. Uh, at this point, I'd like to have Mr. Smart walk through any modifications. We're not going to walk through the whole bill. We just walk through any modifications at this point. We have 13 members, so it would seem to be very short. Okay, Mr. Questions. Smart, um, why don't you um, be extremely short? We have 13 Three senators present. No. And allow present senators to ask any questions they want to ask before we have the final vote. <laughs> Unless nice. senators want to walk through, I discourage. Matt, <laughs> 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 he said it. He wishes to have a walkthrough. It could certainly. Thank you. That was a great walkthrough. Yeah, play. I thought it was too. <clears throat> Are there any questions? Uh, yes, Mr. Menendez. I have just one brief question, which I really uh, want to establish more because I'm sure we'll have trade agreements for the future. So, uh, so to Mr. Reef, um, during the, the mock uh, mock up. Uh, we, uh, I and others, uh, offered an amendment to require the president to annually on this vote, the, on the implementation 50, the nation 49, uh, and three fifths of the Senate duly chosen and sworn, plan. not having voted I understand in the that affirmative, this type of the motion is not.